I'll be talking today about a, a project that we started a few years ago in the Mara, um, really born out of the need to take data that we were collecting in EarthRanger as well as couple it with Google Earth Engine um, and create meaningful outputs for uh, the Mara Elephant project and, and some of our partner organizations. Um, and we've been in close communication all this time with, with EarthRanger and there was a certain point where just said, let's just adopt Ecoscope because it's doing most of what we think we need for other sites as well. And um, we had always, we open sourced Ecoscope last year um, and it's very much been a collaborative project uh, with ideas coming from a lot of different sources and integrating that into a sort of core set of tools um, starting with a Python library and then a set of modules. So I'll be discussing all of that uh, today and then giving you a demo of what's to come and hopefully uh, will come soon. Um, so why? So our problem statement that we are really addressing was how to efficiently turn data into accessible information to drive conservation research, um, management, and policy making. And I think most of the people involved with EarthRanger have a similar um, problem statement. So how do, you, how do you meaningfully collect data? How do you then analyze that and create the outputs that are going to move the needle in a positive direction? Um, what we found was that there was a lack of unif a unified set of tools um, and many different organizations have been doing different solutions. They've been using different tool sets. They've been using various GIS software and, and everyone seems to have some R script floating around. Um, and there's been quite a bit of parallel effort and uh, duplication, not for lack of, of collaboration, but just from lack of communication, probably. Um, so what we want to do is make code sharing and reuse um, to, to uh, check the efficiency box, so everyone shouldn't have to rewrite the same bit of code each time, um, and provide certain standardized approaches that will um, enable monitoring and reporting needs for Earth Ranger sites. So, um, so what is it? And I've been asked this a lot, and fundamentally it, it's a community of developers, researchers, managers, and decision makers, and fundamentally it's a set of analysis modules, um, a library that we're building, and which lead to outputs and dashboards and an automation system, um, as well as long-form reporting um, tools. So how are we going to achieve this? So we're building this, this pipeline right now, um, and we're pretty far along. So you'll have various data sources, so EarthRanger being one, Gundy being one, Google Earth Engine, Smart, um, and many other database um, sources. We'll have an analysis pipeline that we're going to be running these modules um, and leading to data results and visualizations, which then we can view in a um, dashboard type UI, uh, user interface, um, as well as the potential for delivery of the outputs straight to email, um, to a website, uh, over WhatsApp, etc. Um, and as a user, you'll be able to configure analysis modules without ever having to see code. So that's our, our goal, is, is make analysis easy for a developer, you know, one line of code kind of ethos. Um, but as a user, you shouldn't ever have to see code either. Um, but you should be able to interact by scheduling and providing um, parameters that you want. Um, so some of the module examples I'll be going through. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg so far, um, but we have things like activity reporting, patrol coverage, um, we have tracking data, we have data management, so Gantt charts are, are in Ecoscope, um, environmental uh, trends, um, you know, fire burn frequencies and so on, wildlife movement, so we have specialized tools uh, coming from movement ecology, um, and then data, uh, Google Earth integration, so we can leverage the 90 petabytes of satellite imagery that's stored on Google servers via their API, um, as well as more traditional GIS type analyses, densities, um, and so on. 
So um, I guess from our um, a philosophical perspective, we get a lot of questions about sort of activity level reporting. So this is a, a, a very common theme. Um, you know, what is our like caller voltage, you know, so we can make a management decision. Do we replace that caller? Um, what is a, um, what's our patrol effort over the last month? And should we move rangers to a different sector? Um, but then there's also the outcome and impact level reporting. And really we want to try and, um, you know, support both. So impact level reporting would be, you know, is elephant home range growing or shrinking in a given ecosystem? Um, and I think as a community, we have a real opportunity to come up with the, the questions that will define those levels of, of reporting. So um, what is a meaningful question that we can be asking and putting to a minister and saying, you know, this, these, these are where the elephant corridors are and we've identified it from our data. That's a very impactful thing to be able to do. Um, so from a developer standpoint, um, so Ecoscope is a, a open source Python library um, where we've encoded a lot of the sort of common functionality and we will continue to do so and make um, development of modules easier and easier. Um, there will be standardized modules, custom modules that a, a developer could run um, and then interaction with external services. So more and more um, there's web apps, for instance, the WRI site, um, Global Forest Watch has an API that you can interact with. You don't have to figure out all of the analytical steps. You can just ping their API and use the results. So that's sort of how we uh, picture the, the development. Um, it doesn't even have to be Python. It could be R. So we're going to be supporting um, different environments, potentially Julia. Um, and being able to dockerize, well, we, we use Docker environments, so you can run very different environments and run different code sets. Um, there will be a certain amount of structure to an analysis module to get it to run an Ecoscope, um, but we're trying to keep it very general. So as a, as a researcher, for instance, if um, you want to run different modules, this is, you'll have a sort of library or as a, as a manager, uh, to pick from, so standardized modules, you'll also be able to leverage custom code that's maybe been put onto GitHub um, and, and run that as long as it, it fits a certain structure. And then as a manager, you'll be more likely to in a, interact with a, um, a dashboard. So here you're seeing the results of a given analysis module. Um, you'll be able to hopefully combine modules together so that you can create sort of custom uh, UIs. Here's an example of the patrol effort module that we've written that spits out a lot of the information that you get in Tableau right now, including a time density based patrol effort map, um, your raw tracks, we have elephant sightings in this case, um, this is just an example. Um, but you will be able to interact um, to a degree with your data um, in a dashboard-like environment. Um, possibly not to the extent that Tableau currently lets you because we're pushing a lot of the, the analytics onto the server, which does two things. It makes the output simpler and we're, we're addressing a specific question, um, but it also enables us to do much more complicated analyses than you could do with Tableau. Um, and then for decision makers, um, we have the ability to pull out long form PDFs. We, we recognize that a, you know, a minister may not interact with a live dashboard, but probably wants a report um, put on their desk. And that's how the, that decision will, uh, will be made. So we want to be able to easily support both. Um, and so the Ecoscope system is part of this internet of conservation um, and we're adhering to certain principles. So one is the, um, you know, it meets that business need and, and we're doing a lot of user-based research on what are, the, what are the questions that people are trying to answer from their data and how can we um, tailor this system to answering those questions. Uh, it needs to be open, the, the, uh, as much as possible open data, 
where data is not open, at least the source code is open, it can be verified, vetted, it, it builds trust in that system, um, and it's not just a black box. Um, in some cases, yes, you might be leveraging an API, you have no idea what's going on behind that API, but any of the code that we provide will be open, um, and so you can build that, that community of trust. Um, other things, um, sustainable business model, affordable, it will be free, it will be part of the Earth Ranger um, system, um, and it will be supported. So, um, so just a few examples then, um, and we probably have 30 odd modules right now that we've written, and um, we'll be adding more and more. Um, but this would be a, a typical management output. So here's a collar voltage from one of our elephants in the Mara, and you can see, you know, this collar is starting to fail because it's, it's dipped below the historic variance um, that we would expect from this voltage, or from this collar. Um, here's, again, that monitoring dashboard. Uh, this is summarizing our elephant long-term monitoring team, all of the patrols that they've done over an eight-month period and the number of sightings. Um, and how far they've traveled and, and so on. Um, so speed monitoring, so we've, we've got ways of visualizing data as well. So we've, we've got a map client that, that has a lot of visual support tools in it. Um, so you can classify your data according to different classification schemes. Um, we're calculating turn angles, headings, net square displacement, lots of sort of fundamental um, movement ecology metrics. Uh, as well as home range monitoring. So this is an elephant from the Mali Desert, uh, just south of Timbuktu, and we're able to identify both dispersal and core areas using this technique called elliptical time density, where we're looking at not just the number of points, but the time that was spent within given areas of the landscape, as well as the negative space where the elephant did not travel. Um, this is a new technique that was published a few years ago, but is a, a treating data as a network. So we're doing network topology, um, and Catherine Villeneuve, who's here, wrote this module and contributed it to Ecoscope, um, and it's based on work by George Wittermeyer and uh, Guillaume, who, who actually published it, um, but we've operationalized it now within Ecoscope. So that's a goal, too, is that we can take some of these really meaningful um, outputs from a academia, but operationalize them and make them accessible so that you are not trying to figure out how to do that yourself at the site level. Um, so this is an example of how you can identify high connectivity areas from a morass of, of over a million data points, um, and it works very, very quickly. Um, covariate labeling, so this is another um, thing that we've done a lot of, so this is a, a simple day-night so we have an astronomy tool in uh, can tell you moon phase and um, and whether the sun was up or not. So it works in the Arctic, it works in the equator. Um, but we also can integrate with Google Earth Engine. So if, uh, for every dot on the map, you want to know what the slope, what the vegetation land cover was, um, what the NDVI value was. Um, we have tools that then pull that out of Google Earth Engine and give you an annotated track. Um, so from an environmental monitoring, so I think this is a, a little bit of a departure from sort of what Tableau was offering within Earth Rangers that we're also looking at these kind of spatial ecology and, <coughs> um, and different monitoring techniques. So this is a, a normalized difference vegetation index. It's a, a measure of how photosynthetic a plant is. And as NDVI gets higher, it's photosynthesizing more. And so we can run this um, based on, for instance, the MODIS satellite data set. Um, so you can provide Ecoscope an ROI, region of interest, and um, it, it extracts all of the imagery back to the year 2000, and it, it figures out the historic um, mean, the historic variance, and then gives you your current trend within that. And so, you know, um, this shows that this year in the Mara, things have been pretty normal for, from a, a vegetation greenness standpoint. If I were to run this now for northern Kenya, the blue line would have been under the historic variance. So there was a severe drought in northern Kenya. Um, but that's a very quick way to, to see how is the system doing. Um, anomaly monitoring. So an anomaly is basically a cumulative sum from the mean. 
Um, so here we have what's called a beto anomaly. So we're looking at um, the reflectance of the soil over time. So we establish a baseline um, between the year 2000 and 2010, and from that, that start point in 2010, we track how has the surface reflectance changed over the area that we're interested in. Um, and we can see that surface reflectance is climbing, which means probably um, overgrazing um, and lack of grass. So. Um, we have tools, for instance, for fire monitoring, so we can tell you over a, a, an area when, you know, when your last fire was and where it happened, um, which is obviously a very important feature for a lot of, of ecosystems to understand the fire ecology. Um, similar with rainfall, so we can look at rainfall patterns based on satellite estimates, so they're not quite as accurate as weather stations, but they're global, and this goes back to 1980, um, which is the CHIRPS data set. Um, we're also providing temporal trend fitting, so this is a, a um, curve that was generated within one of the analysis modules. Um, we probably won't do something quite as complicated, but this is a, what's called um, Gaussian process regression. So you can fit quite complicated models to your data, um, and if you're doing your own custom module, you could make that as complicated as you want. But we are going to supply sort of out-of-the-box uh, trend fitting tools so that you can do temporal trend fitting very easily. Um, deforestation, so this is an example of using Google Earth Engine, so the, the GLAD um, lab at University of Maryland produces this annual tree cover loss map, and we're simply leveraging that data and then creating the survival curve. So we can see for our given area of interest how much forest was lost, and in this case it was 62% of a forest that we've lost um, in, in the Mara. Um, and again, being able to fit that, that temporal curve. Um, and then other sort of tools that, that we're providing, interaction with GIS layers. So here's an example of pulling data from a spatial database and then doing a, a feature density. So we can tell how many kilometers of road we have per 25 square kilometer grid, grid size. Um, so we're gonna as well um, provide a lot of that sort of base level um, monitoring capacity within the, within the system. Um, so that's sort of an over, high-level overview, <laughs> um, and there's, there's lots more to show, um, but we'll be rolling out those analysis modules sort of over the next six months, so we're cleaning them up, getting them out of alpha into beta, and, uh, and we'll start making them available, and you'll be able to start running them for your sites, um, and if you, you know, want to jumpstart all of that, please come to me and, and, and you, I can share, share them um, as is, or you can wait until you can run those on your site without seeing the, the underlying code. Um, so I'm gonna jump to an example of what that will look like, which is a... Uh, um, so this is a, you know, a, a mock-up of what the system um, will potentially look like. It's, it's not set in stone yet, um, but we have a, a working example that's very similar. Um, I wish this Figma demo just worked <laughs> as the actual tool. Um, but this is an example of, you'll basically have an Ecoscope tab in your EarthRanger site. You'll be able to open it, and you'll see a list of analyses that have been configured. Um, for instance, your patrol effort, you'll be able to click on, look at, you'll be able to interact with it to a certain level. So if you've chosen to group by month, for instance, and, or week, you'll be able to select drop downs and do that um, and, and take a look at, at that output specifically. Um, if I go back, um, here's an example of our, we, so at Mar Elephant Project, we have a quite a complicated tracking report that we run for every individual collared elephant. Um, so this is an example of it, of the module. So it's pulling data from EarthRanger. Um, it's also pulling a profile photo of the elephant that we store somewhere else. Um, it's generating an overview map. It's um, 
creating a caller timeline of when we put the callers on and how long they lasted and, and what the source failure was, um, some basic metrics around the track of the animal. So this elephant's been tracked for 11.1 .1 years. Um, we're doing net square displacement speeds and minimum convex polygon home range asymptote. So we can see to what extent have we mapped the full, the full range of this elephant. We're also generating a speed map. Um, and then we do a seasonal home range. So we use uh, another module in Ecoscope that can calculate seasons. And the way we do that is extracting NDVI. We fit a Gaussian mixture model and then we bifurcate the data into dry and wet based on the NDVI value. We then figure out the timeline and we calculate home range based on the timeline. And you can see here then we have a dry season, wet season home range graph. Um, we also then pull in data from a spatial database, um, which could also be Earth Ranger. Um, and then we calculate the, the percent time that the elephant spent within different land use units. So we can see this elephant 100% of its time in Kenya, 8.9% of its time in agriculture. Um, so each of these outputs gets generated by Ecoscope. Um, we can look at a different one. Um, and this whole analysis, we have close to 84 elephants now, takes about two hours for it to run. Um, so this isn't something we'd run you know, every day, but every month or every six months, we can have it updated. So if you look at the, excuse me, um, and we also provide a way to access all of the interim results. So if you want the actual raw data that got spit out during the analysis, um, you can go and right here we've, we've chosen Google Drive. So I have a, a Google Drive folder for that given run of the analysis that has all of the interim outputs, including a PDF uh, folder with PDFs for each elephant. Um, if we go back, so we'll look at, um, and then here, for instance, is the, the betweenness index that's been run. Um, and if we want to look how you would configure a new module, so you would, you would set up new analysis. Source, um, Google Earth Engine being one of them, Earth Ranger, Gundi, Smart, um, and then where you want the results stored. So I could choose from, you know, Drive, Dropbox, Google Cloud, um, Amazon S3. Um, I set configuration parameters that have been exposed by the module. So I could say, you know, when should this analysis start and end? Um, and what area of interest should it uh, uh, be run over? And I'll be able to, to select on the map um, or provide a shapefile. And then some of the specific analysis configuration parameters, like which image collection do I want? What's the scale factor, et cetera? So those are more specific to the analysis, and, um, but we'll provide def defaults. Um, once you've set those, you can set the schedule. So I want this run monthly, for instance. Um, and I want it run on the last day of every month. Um, do I want to overwrite old results or keep those for posterity or for comparison? Um, and finally, who do I want to share the analysis output with? So we'll have a, a way to publicly link to that result. So if you want to share it publicly, um, or if you just want to keep it within a, an authenticated set of users. Um, so once you've clicked execute, we see the analysis starting to run and, um, and some status updates. Once it's finished, you'll have a, um, you know, it's, been, it's complete. And then here, you'll be able to link to the analysis results. So there's that analysis. And now, maybe I want to share this to Instagram, or I want to provide a, a public link that I
sort of our automation environment, and that's what we're, we're working on right now. Um, so expect more news on this in the next few months. Um, and then I also wanted to show you another element of Ecoscope that we've recently launched, which is a desktop app. Um, we were getting a lot of um, users saying, I can't download data easily out of EarthRanger. Um, and so what we did is built on top of Ecoscope an app um, that you can get from our ecoscope.io website, and it will allow you to connect to EarthRanger right now and download events and observation data. And this is really targeted at GIS users, I would guess, because it's, it's a way you can connect. Um, for instance, here, I will go to the download page. And so I'm connected to our MEP dev server, um, and I can look up, oh, sorry, go get observations, so I can get subject group observations. Um, it populates a list based on the list of subject groups. I can click, um, I can select a start date, end date, and then download. And this will pull records out of EarthRanger. Um, and then you have the choice of saving as a geo package if you want to use this data in a QGIS or ArcGIS environment, or as a CSV if you're someone who wants to work in R. Um, or Python. So if I do this, okay. And now, if I opened up QGIS and drag that geo package, there's my my observation data out of EarthRanger. So it's a very fast way now of getting. Hi. Um, whoop, that was loud. I was really interested in the reports that you generated from the different satellite tracks of different elephants. Um, and in my world, much of our animal tracking is based on photo ID rather than satellite tags. Is that something that you've considered implementing, is being able to generate reports based on photo ID records? Yeah. So um, on another uh, project, we've been working on something called Elephant Book which is a photo ID based system for recording elephant observations. Um, If I can add to that, actually, up, so this is nice. It's easy to talk into. Um, so the one of the uh, real fantastic things about this framework is the fact that you can build on top of it using uh, native coding approaches. And so if you wanted to link this into some sort of photo storage application that has an API, you can do that, take the output of that, then put it through the analytics modules. So it would take a little bit of development the first time it's done, but then also something that I don't think Jake uh, mentioned is that that could then be also contributed to the community so that once an organization had written that, it's then available for everyone. We're also using Wild Me as well for photo identification of North Atlantic right whales, but it seems like there, an integration with Wild Me would be super cool for both of you. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and yeah, great point, Jess. The, the point of this too is to save all of us time by contributing our knowledge and ideas on the way analyses should be constructed, but not spending a lot of time on how to 
develop the code. So as the Earth Ranger team, we're going to have some resource to put towards this to you know, save you time to figure out all that plumbing and authentication and how do you host a UI and how do you run Kubernetes pods and all of that kind of stuff um, you won't have to deal with. You'll just be able to focus on you know, what's the question I have from my data or, or how do I collect data in a way that's going to lead to a meaningful question or answer. Um, so that's really, we're trying to streamline that process. Hi, do you have plans to include predictive analytics to one of your modules? Predictive analytics? Yeah. So I think at the outset, we're going to be very focused on the monitoring. So to me, monitoring is you're collecting data, you're able to visualize that data, you can look at trends, but you're not doing inference. Um, and I feel like inference becomes sort of the, the realm of academics. And, and your models you know, are, are quite specific to your either geographic region or problem. Um, it could be that if a model is generalizable and, and um, would be of benefit to many people, that we could include that kind of analytics. Um, but in terms of providing very specific predictive modeling for a given species, I mean, that could be done as a custom module, but we may not ship it as a standard module with EarthRanger. Sorry, I don't want to crash your party, Jake, yeah. but just yeah. in, in, in the spirit of this conference being about open dialogue and, yeah. and, and uh, uh, collaboration, um, I, I wanted to add to that also that one of the reasons for moving in this direction of Egoscope away from Tableau is that it does allow us to take advantage of that kind of powerful analytics. So while today there's probably not too many approaches use, using predictive modeling that can be applied to general landscapes, um, at least this provides us with a way of implementing it for a specific landscape and then having the framework of that available when technology and the data advance to the point that we can make that more generalizable. Your name's on the presentation too, yeah. so jump in. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was wondering, with a Google Earth Engine, you said that um, Ecoscope can pull the satellite imagery from there and obviously run the NDVI analyses. Um, is it also a, in the scope of, of, of Ecoscope to run some of the machine learning uh, algorithms that they have in Google Earth Engine to generate land cover maps? Because for us, um, or for the work that I do in M&E and, and data analysis, it would be really interesting to be able to monitor land cover change over time or even back in time. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, that's a good example of a model that's, um, you know, if it's in Google Earth Engine, it's, it's usually fairly generalizable. And um, so, um, yeah, absolutely. You can, because we're leveraging the Python API that Google Earth Engine has, then you have the full, you can write a module that can do any of the analyses that you can do in Earth Engine. Um, so if you're used to working with the JavaScript API, for instance, or the Playground, all of that basically translates almost one-to-one -to, -one to the Python. how to build a module that you could actually enter words and or search for words. Um, yeah, I mean, what that would entail would be to write a custom module that's connecting to, you know, well, if you've got your data in, in um, EarthRanger already, then we can pull that and then you can apply, you know, you could, you could potentially set up your annual report to use chat GBT um, and spit out your annual report with this. I mean, I'm not saying you'd want to, but you can apply um, very, very sophisticated models to your data and use this analysis pipeline to run them. Um, so if that's something that you know, most users want, then we could, we could look at supporting that. Um, if it's a one-off thing, for your use case, then that might be a custom thing and, and that could then hopefully be a contribution back to the community as well. Uh, 
it, and, and, and similarly, they, it, just asking the question, we had a similar question come up um, when we were chatting with Wellington from Space for Giants yesterday. Um, we should add Google Docs integration to the roadmap. For instance, this narrative that we've written for elephants, um, we actually store it in the subject table in EarthRanger, but that could be a Google Doc that's kept up to date. And, um, but it, the code just pulls that every time it runs, and you've got an up-to-date um, biography for that elephant. Well, thank you very much. If there's no further questions, please feel free to, to find me afterwards or Jess, and uh, happy to answer any more. And um, yeah, really excited about this, and I think it's going to be a big um, benefit to all of us. So thanks for your attendance. <laughs>